Welcome everyone to the March Lunch with NEMA. This is Heather in the um, New England Museum office in Arlington, Mass. Just want to say hi in the chat feature if you guys are new to a Lunch with NEMA. This is actually how we will be communicating with each other and with Meg. So if you guys just want to type in hi and where you're from, that would be great so we could see who's on the call today. And if you are having any audio issues, um, please make sure to dial in instead of using your computer speakers. Um, we have found out the audio was better. And there's Meg in the NEMA office. <laughs> oh, great. And like all Lunch with NEMAs, this re um, webinar is being recorded and will be available on the NEMA website later on this afternoon. If you ever miss any other Lunch with NEMAs, check out our website. We have a lot of lunches that you can watch in your spare time on your lunch breaks. Um, so we're going to get going. Um, looks like we have a good group here. Awesome. We're all over New England today. So Meg, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Alice, so much, Heather. Um, so yes, thank you for joining me on an indoors lunch when it's such a beautiful day outside. I appreciate the company on my lunch break. So uh, this being the last week of March, um, we are saying goodbye to National Women's History Month and rolling right into National Poetry Month. Um, so National Poetry Month is one of my absolute favorites because um, it gives me an excuse to be geeky about poetry for a whole month and nobody gets to tell me I'm overdoing it, which is great. So um, some of you who may have been on a webinar I did last year where I invited people to look at the art and objects in their collections to use them to kind of get some creative inspiration and uh, bring some fun back into your daily museum practice. Um, but today we're going to reverse that and we're mostly going to ignore the objects in favor of looking at the labels instead. Uh, so we are inviting you to hack this label for National Poetry Month, um, either for yourself or getting ideas for your visitors. So that's where I'd like to start, just to get a sense of what you're hoping to get out of today. So if you could let me know whether you're looking for inspiration for yourself, ways to interact with your visitors, or um, basically a, a way to muck with your colleagues. Um, and we will roll forward from there. And Heather, once it looks like everyone's had a chance to vote, if you could. Tegan is saying that these are tough questions, Meg. You're starting That's out right. tough. <laughs> I, sh I should have put in all of the above. Please feel free to vote all of the above in the chat feature if I am being um, far too constraining. We're almost neck and neck with something to inspire yourself and ways to interact with visitors. OK, good. All right, well, we've got a little bit of both of those available for you today. And a lot of the ideas that I'm going to be throwing out there hopefully could be used both ways. So including to occasionally challenge and confuse your colleagues. So as we all know, unfortunately, people tend not to read labels. Um, there was an article on Art News uh, back in 2010 called Your Labels Make Me Feel Stupid, uh, where they say most visitors spend 10 seconds in front of an object, seven to read the label and three to look at the object itself, um, which is feels a little backwards, but seven seconds to read a label is you know, hardly enough anyway. Um, so thinking about what makes for writing a good exhibit label, I think most of us are probably familiar with Beverly Cerro in um, a session at, I believe it was AAM in 2004, talking about best practices in museum exhibition labels. She talked about her turn-ons, texts that are clever, fresh, and make her feel intelligent, uh, though she doesn't like ones that are chirpy or overly familiar. Um, so, And she doesn't like exclamation points, in which case she would probably not like several of the ideas I'm suggesting today. But we shall see. Poetry is all about exclamations, whether you use the punctuation marks or not. Um, and on that note, I would like to know how you feel about poetry.
willing to be here today, so I hope that means you don't hate it. Heather, how are we doing? Um, right now it's looking like a foreign country, but I like to visit. All right, fair enough. I think we will end the voting right there. Um, you guys can see the results. Sounds good. Okay, well the good news is that there might be a solution to the fact that no one reads the rules in the fact that poetry is on the rise. Um, in 2018, the NEA found that despite the fact that previous surveys suggested that fewer and fewer people were reading poetry, and in fact there was a newspaper article that proclaimed essentially poetry is dead, um, between 2012 to 2017, they found that people who were self-reporting reading poetry nearly doubled across the U.S. and more than doubled um, among 18 to 24-year-olds, uh, particularly populations of women and people of color, which is pretty cool. Um, so there is perhaps something in the world of poetry to help inform um, exhibit label practice. And since we did call this hacking your labels, thinking about the kinds of tools you might need, not necessarily for today, um, but if you decide to use any of these in the future at your own institution, things you might need for figurative and literal hacking. Um, I'm a big fan of cutting things up and rearranging them. so. Markers, rulers, scissors, and glue, magnetic sheets, a thesaurus, an internet connection helps because we've got some suggestions for how to use some tools on the internet to play around with your labels, and a sense of humor. It is so easy uh, to take ourselves far too seriously in this field. So when you are playing around with labels, be willing to get playful. So unstick yourself from the walls of your gallery galleries and exhibits and signposts and whatever else you've got exhibit labels stuck to uh, because we've got a bunch of different options for playing around with labels to give you different ways to look at them um, or to invite your visitors to interact with them. Pretty much all of these that I'm suggesting are possibilities for programs in addition to being things that you can be doing behind the scenes to kind of shake up your museum writing practice. So the first one is thinking about doing keyword poems. Um, this can be really interesting if you're doing it with visitors because it's a great way to see how well they key into your interpretive themes. Um, it can also be a way for you to spot the interpretive themes you didn't realize you were putting across if you've got a whole pile of labels and um, sort of didn't necessarily think about there being an organizing principle behind them, but sort of one came through anyway. Um, that certainly can help happen, particularly if you've got kind of curatorial enthusiasms going on. So um, I invite you to, after this webinar, go through and pick a gallery or a room in your historic site or whatever else and pick at least five labels in your house, in your gallery, etc. No more than 10. Um, and then pick at least three words that jump out at you from each of those labels. Not more than five words, otherwise you're going to end up with like way too many to with. Uh, and try not to pick all proper nouns. You can pick a few, um, but you know, hopefully you've got some really interesting active verbs and things like that in your labels um, that will kind of bounce out at you um, to your word list. So go through. Don't think about it too hard. Just like read the label. Maybe read it twice, possibly look at it backwards so you're looking at the, the words individually instead of necessarily the words as they are forming a sentence, and pick three words to five words that really appeal to you from that label. Add them to your word list. Um, and once you've done that with five to ten labels, go through, look at your word list, see what you've come up with, and write a poem. Um, so we're actually going to try that right now, at least up to the word list. Please don't panic. Um, so. None of these exercises, if you feel like poetry is really foreign to you, none of them require you to write poetry, but I find them more fulfilling if you go all the way to the end um, and at least give it a shot. There is no wrong way to write a poem. So um, I have, because I am exactly the kind of museum nerd who goes to museums and takes pictures of other people's labels, um, I have years worth of label examples here and I've pulled together 
four for you um, from the Portolbury in London, um, which is a museum I completely love. And if you guys have a chance to go to London and haven't ever been there, I highly recommend it. Um, so we've got a set of four paintings in their labels here, and I invite you to read the label and pick three to five words, scribble them on a scrap piece of paper wherever you're sitting, because uh, we're going to want to take a look at your word lists at the end. So a couple of minutes here to look at Gorgeous Cezanne. read it aloud for you because some people find words strike the ear differently than the eye. So this says, Paul Cezanne, the lake at Annecy, 1896, oil on canvas. Cezanne describes this mountain lake near the French border with Switzerland as a scene one might expect to find in the albums of young lady travelers. Instead of recording the standard picturesque view, Cezanne set out to explore the landscape in terms of patterns of form and color. The tree in the foreground gives a sense of scale and distance to the castle on the far banks of the lake slopes of the mountains close off the scene. Moving on to our second one, hopefully everyone's had a chance to pick their three to five words. This one is a lovely Van Gogh landscape called Peach Trees in Blossom from 1889, oil on campus. This is Van Gogh's last view of a plain outside Arles that he often painted since settling in the south of France in 1888. He wrote to the painter Paul Tignac, everything is small there, even the mountains, as in certain Japanese landscapes, which is the reason why the subject attracted me. The snow-capped peak on the right, a deliberate echo of Mount Fuji, and blossoming trees create a peaceful atmosphere. But the bent figure at left emphasizes this is a man-made landscape. At the bottom, we've got the credit information Part of the purchase of the Samuel Cartold Trust. Third option is a Degas. If you could not tell, I got all of these from the Impressionist Gallery at the Cartold. Edgar Degas, 1834 to 1917, Lady with a Parasol, Maybe around 1870 to 72, oil on canvas. Degas abandoned this work at a relatively early stage of preparation, and it remained in the studio until his death. While some areas are quite sketchy, others, as the woman's profile and details of her hat, are painted with great delicacy. This picture belongs to a group of works in which Degas explored the effect of light on the human figure. An old label on the back of the painting calls it at the race course, which may explain the woman's elegant experience. Oh, sorry, appearance. And this is from the Samuel Cartold Trust, Prince's Gate Quest. In More. Monet. Thames below Westminster, about 1871. Monet traveled to London to avoid the Franco-Prussian War. Gray, hazy sky successfully evokes the fogs for which 19th century London was notorious. Westminster Bridge and the Houses of Parliament are shown in the background. On the right, a wooden pier projects from the newly constructed Victoria Embankment. Oil on canvas, used by Lord Astor of Hebert. everybody had a chance to select their words? Does anybody need me to go back to any of them? Let me know in the chat feed. All right, in the absence of panicked typing, on we go. Um, I would like to know, please type into the chat feature three to five of your favorite words from all of the labels, and we'll see what people came up with.
right. Got some patterns emerging here already. Patterns blossoming, hazy. Blossoming appealed to a lot of us. I think we've all got spring fever. Delicacy, patterns. Awesome. I found when I was doing my list that I accidentally ended up with a bunch of things that were alliterative. So lots of D's, lots of T's, lots of P's, and lots of B's, um, which is great because when I think about writing poetry, I think a lot about how it sounds and I get very drawn to um, things that have repeated uh, sound patterns to them. Very musical, which to me is very important. So, okay, very cool. Thank you so much for sharing pieces of your word lists. Um, the last step is to take your word list and assemble it into a poem. You are not constrained to only the words in your word list because you don't have enough of them. Um, although you do get a really kind of cool list poem going if you just read the chat out loud. Um, it's got a kind of uh, guzzle sound to it, which is one of those poetry forms that kind of wraps in on itself and uses uh, heavy reliance on repeated language. So here we go. Um, I went through and wrote a poem about wanderlust uh, because it struck me that most of these paintings that I had ended up loving and taking pictures of um, really suggested how the Impressionists all really just wanted to travel all over the place. Um, they were themselves travelers, they were depicting travelers, um, they were looking at landscapes and, you know, always looking for things that were both new and familiar in a landscape. So that was what I got out of accidental themes from the Courtauld Gallery. The next one is a little bit more of looking again at the language in existing labels, um, but requires a computer to instead um, thinking about creating a word cloud out of all of your exhibit labels. So if you are trying to figure out, say, are we using too much jargon in our labels? Um, how heavily do we rely on the same kinds of terminology across a gallery? And, you know, is that a good thing or a bad one? You know, are we not emphasizing the words that we care about enough? Are we overemphasizing words that maybe we're not doing a good enough job defining, that kind of thing? A word cloud is really useful for helping you figure that sort of thing out. Um, so if you take all your label copy and run it through a word cloud generator, there are easily a dozen online if you just Google word cloud generator and you can try a couple of different ones because they have different parameters. Their outputs come out slightly differently. Uh, you've got more or less artistic control in how they look if you want to be able to use your word cloud as a label um, in your exhibit uh, so that you're kind of making the keywords of your exhibit visible. Um, so Using your word cloud, you can look at what your most popular words are and you can either use that to try creating a poem from it or find a different way to say what it is you're trying to say without using those words. It's the kind of um, taboo game version of trying to write an exhibit label. How do I explain this thing without using these words? Which is great for if you are kind of having trouble figuring out how to get concept across um, to give yourself some artificial constraints like that. Uh, think about it more creatively. Um, it's a great way to get around to using metaphors and similes and things like that that might actually be easier for your average audience to understand uh, if you forbid yourself from using jargon. Um, I am not picking on the United States Botanical Garden because I think they do amazing work, but this is a label that I thought could really use a word cloud and um, some poetic treatment uh, to make it a little shorter and punchier, uh, more memorable and less terrifying to look at. 
Um, I did actually read this whole label because I was kind of fascinated with wind power. Um, but <laughs> I think uh, it's the kind of label where if you have a bunch of labels like this in your gallery, maybe they would benefit uh, from a word cloud kind of treatment. Another thing you can do is think about genre swapping your labels. How would you rewrite your label if you worked for a different kind of museum? You are largely talking in the science realm, how would you look at something from an artistic point of view or a historical point of view? Uh, if you are working in a history setting, you know, what's the science behind the history or what's, you know, artful about what you're looking at? Um, where are the marks of human hands if you want to look at it that way? Um, you can also think about it not just from where you're standing, but who you're talking to. Um, how would you rewrite this label if you were writing it for a friendly interstellar alien? What would they need to know? Um, what about someone from a dis different timeline? Their history happened totally different than ours. So, you know, what are the key points that you would need to explain how we got from point A to point F um, if they went from point A to point L and they skipped B, e, F, and G? Um, and then think about how would you write it if you were writing for your best friend. That would get you back to probably annoying Beverly Sarrell with being overly familiar. But I don't think that's necessarily always the worst case, depending on who you want to create in your gallery. So um, I am offering one of my own labels up for a little critique here. Um, I wrote this when I was just starting out in the museum world, um, discovering museums. And I was, I think, a thing to do some of all of that in one label. And I'm not saying it was terribly um, successful, but I'm offering it up to you to think about how could you give this one a little bit more focus. It starts out talking about um, the interactive exhibit, the harmonograph table that the people would be standing right next to, and that gets into talking about how it's art and math and science and recording time all at once, and then gets into talking about patterns, uh, which is an invitation to kind of make connections with other things that are happening in other exhibits nearby. Um, not the best label I think I ever wrote, um, but you know, you could take this from any of those keywords and think about, you know, how would you rewrite this label to make it more about the art that's created by um, physics? Or you could talk more about the timing and how a harmonograph drawing is like the rings of a tree. And, and could you actually calculate out how long it took to draw the center of that ladybug? So there are a bunch of different ways that you could take something like that that starts as a science concept. But you can talk about when the harmonograph was what else has it been used for um, in art, math, or science in the course of history. Another opportunity, and this is where you could seriously actually start cutting up your labels and playing around with them, um, is think about putting a giant cross on your wall. That would potentially be a very interactive way for your visitors to look at your labels. Um, and it has the benefit of people need to read the clues first. And that keys into the fact that um, there have been studies that show that people learn concepts and vocabulary better if you introduce the concepts first and then say, and there's a word for this concept, and it is blank. Um, so people will understand, you know, the difference between mitosis and meiosis, or they will understand um, you know, theories of change in history or any other kinds of things. They will get a better grasp on art terminology, et cetera, if you say, here's what this concept is, because you know, people find it really rewarding if you go, and there's a word for that. You know, when you find out there's a word for that, there's often like this sort of sense of satisfaction, like, oh, it's not something I just you know, I'm not the only one who sees this thing or has thought this thing. Other people have too, and there's a word for it. It's very satisfying. So that kind of emotional satisfaction actually helps people learn. Um, plus, of course, as we all know, interactive things make things sticky. Um, and 
when you surprise people or you challenge them just enough so that they have to work a little to be able to do something, that sense of accomplishment makes things more memorable. Um, it's also a great kind of prototyping evaluation kind of thing. So if you have some explanatory text out on your walls and you want to see how well are people understanding the explanatory text you've put out there, like how much are they grasping those concepts, you can ask them to do a crossword at the end and see how much trouble they have with it. Um, so thinking about a possible label where you could talk about um, adaptations for environment, yay habitat, um, there are a lot of great keywords on this label. It's nice and simple. I love this label. Um, but you could turn it into a crossword, I think. Um, and that could potentially be really interesting. Um, so I would like you to have a look and think about if you were trying to do a sort of compare and contrast crossword keyword puzzle here, what, say, two words might you pick from this label um, to be intersecting on a crossword? And you know, pick your two words that jump out at you as an excellent crossword here. All right, Scarlett's going tricky by using something that overlaps on an E. When I was looking at this one, I thought it would be interesting to try to where one could overlap things that were kind of contrasting elements in these two paws. So overlap claws with webbing, for instance or palaces with pads. Oh, go Tegan. She's double lining up on the U for insulates and cushion. Swimming and walking. An interesting pair. All right, cool. Thank you for playing along on that. The next idea is one of my favorites um, because I really enjoy pastiche, which is when you are basically doing an homage in the style of somebody else's. Um, so I think it's very fun to take something and rewrite it as if it were being written by somebody else. Um, this gets back to the way I love the way language sounds. Um, so. It might be fun to take a label that you're having trouble with or an object you're having trouble with and say, how would I write this label if I were Edgar Allan? Or how would I write this label if I were Gwendolyn Brooks? Um, I picked people on my suggestion list um, who all have styles and poems that are fairly recognizable in kind of the common knowledge. Um, you know, most people have a sense that, you know, oh, okay, E. Cummings is that guy who, you know, the words are all over the page and the punctuation is totally random and sometimes missing altogether. And, you know, um, they all know, you know, the world is puddle wonderful and mud luscious, et cetera. Or, you know, um, Maya Angelou has had a big kind of resurgence in common vocabulary, I feel like, since 2016. Um, there have been an awful lot of people quoting Still I Rise, for instance. Um, Gwendolyn Brooks, most people don't know most of her work, but most people have at least heard We Real Cool. Um, and of course, 
um, Poe and Longfellow and Shakespeare get parodied all the time. Um, pastiche is a little different from parody because it's done uh, with gentle humor and respect uh, instead of, you know, mocking. Um, but still, um, you know, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere has been rewritten probably several million times, um, not to mention The Raven. So all of those are options for a way you could rewrite a label just to, you know, catch your attention, think seriously about, you know, what really are the most important pieces to carry along or, you know, think about um, just what kind of voice are you using in your museum labels and what's the tone you want to strike. Sometimes it's helpful to go way out of your comfort zone to get back to where you want to be. So this one, I really enjoy all the like wacky ceramics that have invocations on them and things like that. Um, you know, pictures that say things like success to the crooked but interesting town of Boston and whatnot. Um, this one is a British bowl um, from the 1790s, which of course was uh, during um, the French Revolution and leading into the Napoleonic Wars and whatnot uh, when the British naval power was at its height. Um, and so the original label says Stoneware Bowl, about 1796. Hi, Julie. So glad you made it. Um, so this label says, the inside of this bowl bears the words, may all British admirals have the eye of a hawk, the heart of a wolf, and the spirit of a Rodney. The phrase refers to Admiral Edward Hawk, victor at Quiberon Bay, General James Wolfe, who died at Quebec, and Admiral George Rodney, victor of the Battle of the Saints in 1782. Uh, the spirit of a Rodney may refer to a type of broad-based spirit decanter named after him. I love the number of um, named alcoholic things that they came up with in Britain. Um, Napoleon brandy and all of that sort of thing. Um, so... I decided that this one with its wacky capitalizations and the fact that it was already uh, something of a poetic invocation really deserved to be rewritten in the form of a Dr. Seuss verse. Uh, so this is my attempt at Seussifying the Stoneware Bowl. And I apologize, Club Eating really hated this slide. I tried reformatting it several different ways and some of it was always going to be not terribly readable. So here we go. The soul of this bowl beneath salad dressing is a bit of a joke and a bit of a blessing, containing the wishes of sailors at sea, not to be food for fishes, but winning and free. Oh, admirals, they say, be cunning and wise, like three admirals past whose traits we so prize. If you spy a French vessel, we want you to squawk what you've spotted with eyes like a hawk. And no running away, have a heart like a wolf, not a cowardly thumper like Grumpus McGrolf. Plus, have Rodney spirit, by which we mean drink, but not till you're tipsy or we'll sink, which will stink. Um, Good one, Meg. Have to say oh, that. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Heather makes me write all of the uh, poetry reminding people that conference registration deadlines are coming. So. <laughs> we have to spice it up. <laughs> <laughs> I might see if I can sucify one this year. We'll see. Um, so, again. Yeah. Reminder that uh, most of us got into this field because we thought it would be fun and we do have the tendency to take ourselves too seriously. So sometimes a little silliness is exactly what you need in a day. And we are back to thinking about keywords, um, but instead of selecting from a bunch, we're looking at restricting ourselves to subtracting until you get down to um, something else. So blackout poems are ones that where you take existing text and you just black out everything except the words you want to leave behind uh, to create something entirely new. Um, so this one was one that I did for the Mass Poetry Fest um, when, back when I was working at the PB Essex Museum and we were talking about ways to incorporate visual art and poetry um, about um, actually doing an illustrated version, but that's a lot more complicated than you need to get. Um, this is also, you know, a reasonably therapeutic way to go at your labels. You just, you know, scribble all over them with a marker. Um, I recommend that you scribble all over rafts or copies of your labels and not actually take a marker to your walls or you might get in trouble with the workers. 
So this one is um, an artifact from the British Museum. And um, it is a dish bowl. And it's one of those like really long labels that's just asking to have half of it erased. Um, so I thought it was going to be a lot easier to make, turn this one into a poem than it actually ended up being. I had a lot of trouble with this one. I think I went through about three drafts, which is why doing this digitally worked really well because I could move around my little um, lines that were crossing out the words uh, and I didn't have to start all over again with a fresh version. So this label was too long to read the whole thing, but I'll just read a little bit of it. Um, it says, this muscular bowl is an example of the magnificent stone carvings of the Picts, the Celtic-speaking people who ruled North and East Scotland between around AD 400 to the 50s. The distinctive symbols of Pictish art, including animals, artifacts, and geometric mo motifs, are now enigmatic. In some cases, they may represent a type of commemorative writing. It goes on to further describe what's been carved into this sandstone boulder. Um, because this is actually a for all that it's lengthy, it's a fairly tightly written label. I had a lot of trouble uh, with turning it into a poem, but I tried. Um, so we took the bowl entirely out of it and just talked about the stone um, and kind of personified the stone and thought about kind of the power it might represent in and of itself. This muscular stone who ruled north and east, distinctive and now enigmatic in some boulder this, a major fortress, lifelike and contoured, once powerful, perhaps. And again, this is at least my third attempt of essentially erasing pieces and putting them back in again to figure out uh, how to tell a story with fragments. So that also, I feel like, is a great exercise in thinking about what really needs to be in your label or doesn't. Going back to Goofy, um, comic strips are a great, great way to think about doing your labels. And I would like to um, give a shout out to the Fairfield History Center and Museum. They just um, actually won an award for an exhibit where they were using panels from a graphic novel um, in their exhibit. Um, graphic novels have become a lot more mainstream. Um, kind of. Comic art is more widely recognized now as being an art form in and of itself. Um, a lot of people read web comics. Uh, the one that I've got here is by Kate Beaton. She's a Canadian artist. Uh, she's originally from um, Nova Scotia. And uh, she started with this website called Harka Vagrant. And it was so popular that she's actually done two books um, that are basically a collection of comics for history, literature, and art nerds. Um, so I really recommend uh, her books, Heart of Vagrant and uh, Step On It Pops, or no, Step Aside Pops. Um, they are really, really funny. Um, and a great way to kind of get a memorable snippet of history. Because um, she usually includes the actual history underneath the comic. Um, so you kind of get the amusing version first and then the real story underneath. Mm. So there are some stories in history that are just begging to be turned into comics. Um, this one is my favorite of my collection of nerdy travel pictures of other people's labels. Um, this is the story of Bladud um, from Bath. Uh, so this was at the assembly rooms at Bath in England. Um, and the story that they're recounting here is from, um, as it was told by Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, who they say was a leading historian, but also a fantasist who loved good stories and sometimes confused them with historical writing. Um, so yes, um, in Geoffrey of Monmouth's version of the story, this label says, we are told that on his father's death, Bladud returned from Athens, where he was educated, accompanied by four philosophers. He founded a university at Stanford in Lincolnshire, and through the practice of magic, created the hot springs at Bath, where he did dedicated a temple to Minerva and placed within it an eternal flame. He also made feathered wings and learned to fly, but fell on the temple of Apollo at New Troy and broke his neck, whereupon he was succeeded by King Lear. 
I, I can't believe actually Kate Beaton hasn't illustrated this story yet, um, but I'm kind of tempted to send it to her and ask her to because I would love to see her take. Um, I would also love to see your take, so if you feel inspired to draw a comic about the feathered flying king of England, um, I would really, really love to see it. Uh, and my email is available on the NEMA website, so take a picture and send it to me. And if you cannot tell, we're flip-flopping between things that are creative and things that are destructive. Um, magnetic poetry is great therapy. If you've got exhibit labels you hate, take those to them, cut them up, and rearrange them. Um, it's also a great way to get rid of all the old magazines that are sitting around your house if you're looking for a program idea. Uh, this was another one I did with the Massachusetts Poetry Festival um, where um, if you have volunteers or interns who are perpetually finishing projects faster than you can come up with things for them to do, if you've just got a stack of magazines and you ask them to find cool words that are, you know, roughly half an inch tall or so, ads are really good for that kind of thing and get them to cut them out, um, you can amass a pretty good library of magnetic poetry pretty easily. Um, it's also a fun thing to do when you're hanging out at home. Um, but it's great because it's an activity that's appropriate for anyone who can read. Um, you can also approximate it with post-it notes if you don't have the time, patience, or magazine stack uh, to hand to create piles of um, word collages. You can also do this with post-it notes where you invite visitors to say, write words that they associate with a particular object or interactive or whatever and sort of stick them on the walls around that object so you get a kind of crowdsourced labeling. Um, works a little bit like doing crowdsourced tagging on a digital catalog or that sort of thing um, where you get to see what your visitors are associating with things, not necessarily what you want them to think about, but what they are thinking about when they're looking at. This is a thing that uh, I thought the USS Constitution did a very interesting job with in one of their galleries a while back. Um, they had a reusable magnetic board um, where people could pick from the set of vocabulary over on the left side and move it over to the right. Uh, so I don't know whether they were actually tracking to see which words got used the most or things like that, um, but it was an interesting reusable way of getting people to talk about the things that they associated with the USS Constitution. So I thought that was very cool. And the last idea really is more purely programmatic than it is useful on the back end of things, um, but thinking about ways you can invite people to take language from your exhibits or inspiration from what's going on in and around your organization um, to do 2D and 3D constructions, including poetry, uh, whether that's a kind of collaborative type project where people are adding their lines to something like a poet tree, uh, I'm not above puns, um, or if uh, you're inviting them to help create a stained glass window or anything like that. Um, that can, again, be a great way to invite people to look at your galleries with kind of an interactive eye towards the art and language available there. And if all else fails, you've gone through all of these poetry writing exercises and you still haven't figured out how you want to poemify your goals, you can always put poetry up in your gallery entirely. And sadly, something seems to have happened to this picture. I swear it loaded just fine on my computer, but it seems to have flattened badly. Um, so this was a shot from um, Greenwich, again in England, uh, where they have a quote from the poem, let's go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in the sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. So I was very happy to see that just up in a museum gallery. And should you find that poetry being a foreign country you would like to visit and you would like to visit more often, I have two recommendations because there's a lot of poetry resources out there and it's very easy to get overwhelmed even if poetry is your native language. Um, so 
Two of my current favorites are there's a podcast by the U.S. Poet Laureate, Tracy K. Smith, um, it's called The Slow Down. It's a five-minute daily podcast where she talks about a poem that she likes and sort of why it speaks to her and what it reminds her of, mostly something to do with what's going on in her own life. And then she reads the poem and she doesn't tell you what you should think about it and she doesn't talk about you know, necessarily anything to do with the mechanics of how or why the poem works. Um, she just sort of says, here's what I find interesting and I'd like to read it to you. Um, it's a very lovely, calm five minutes in bad traffic in the morning. So I highly recommend the slow down. Um, and then uh, Rattle Poetry is an online poetry journal. They do a daily email newsletter with a poem a day. Um, and the one I find most interesting is on Sundays, they do Rattle's Poets Respond. So by the end of the day, Friday of every week, they invite poets to write a poem that responds to something that happened in the news within the last week. And um, over the weekend, they pick one of those poems. And so it's basically a poetry newspaper, poems, poems responding to current events that comes out every Sunday. Um, and I find those often incredibly fascinating. And sometimes I find out about events that I missed in the news by reading the poem instead. So those are my two recommendations for if you need more poetry post-label hacking. So we have a few minutes left. Um, if anybody has any thoughts, reactions, or questions, um, I would be happy to get to go back to anything or expand on anything or hear your ideas about how you would like to go at your labels with marker, scissors, or otherwise. I think everybody's still taking in all the information that you just shared <laughs> with the different ideas. Sorry, I talk fast. <laughs> All right, well, if anybody wants to come talk to me further about writing in museums, poetry, or otherwise, uh, you know where to find me. I am here in the NEMA office. And my email is meg.winnicates at nemanet.org. And this presentation is being recorded, so the um, whole webinar will be available on our website shortly. Um, I am certainly happy to make a PDF of the slides, and we can have that available for download, too, if that would be helpful. Is that what you were asking for, Gloria? Yes, we um, usually provide the slides um, along yeah. with the YouTube video um, to go along with it. Sometimes the slides are kind of out there compared to looking at them separately, but um, it's definitely good to look at them together when you're going through the audio for the YouTube. Um, and then Scarlett just left a note where the Lunch with Nima um, recordings are available, and that list there will say if there's a recording or not. And then there's also a follow-up survey, so if you want to take a second just to fill out a little bit of information to give us some feedback. And if you ever are interested in giving a future lunch with NEMA, um, definitely contact Meg. Um, we are Absolutely. open to suggestions and ideas of what you would like to see discussed or talked about in a one-hour time block. Fun or serious. Yep. Just in case you thought I was anti-seriousness. <laughs> we take everything. Um, that is useful and informative to the museum community, I should say. Um, <laughs> which this was, <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's good, especially with a Dr. Seuss one sometimes, to get a little bit out of your comfort zone and um, do some wackiness to kind of formulate and think about things that are a little bit more serious, so that is good. So I think we're going to wrap it up a little early. I just want to say, Meg, thank you so much for um, giving this and talking about some of your poetry, too, and coming up with some, some poems um, for this presentation. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today for the Lunch with Nima. We will be talking about volunteers in April, so join us again for a future Lunch with Nima, and have a great day, everyone. Yes, Thanks, go guys. out and enjoy the sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>